There's a third link in the chain that's not stopped yet, and this is God's calling in time. And the cool thing now is in verse 30, we go from eternity past, God set His love upon us, foreknew us, and God predetermined what to do with us, make us into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. But now in history and in time, our experience was God called us. So all three so far are the work of God. God foreknew us, God predestined us, and God called us. Notice verse 30, moreover whom he did predestinate, them he also, what? Called. Now, with calling, we move, as I said, from eternity past to the present time. The call of God is the historical application of his eternal predestination. The word called there means literally to call in or to call unto. And it comes through the preaching of the gospel. A lot of people say that, you know, if you believe in election and you believe in predestination, then there's really no need to preach the gospel. Not so. The God who has ordained the end, the salvation of sinners, has also ordained the means to that end, the preaching of the gospel. Don't forget that. The God who has ordained the end, the salvation of sinners, has ordained the means to that end that they hear by the preaching of the gospel. How they are going to hear, how they're going to hear unless there's a preacher, and how will they preach unless they be sent? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. And so the means by which sinners come to Jesus is by the preaching of the word. No doubt you're here tonight because someone shared Christ with you. You heard a sermon. You read a track. You read the scriptures. A mother or father, a family member, someone told you about Jesus, led you in the sinner's prayer, invited you to come to Christ. There was the sharing of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and you heard the gospel, and then you came to him for salvation. So in time, God called you to the preaching of his word. Now this calling has been put into two categories, the general or universal call, and then the second category is the internal specific or effectual call, as some would like to refer to it. The general call is is that Jesus stood on the great day of the feast, John 7, and he said, if anyone's thirsty, notice the word anyone. If anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. All you got to do is say, I'm thirsty and drink, and you can come to him. That's a universal call. But God comes to you by the Holy Spirit specifically, and he convicts you of your sin and your need for Jesus Christ. This is the call of God, the work of the Holy Spirit. I'll never forget, just got out of high school, young man, and the strangest thing began to happen to me all of a sudden I began to think about God. I began to sense my need for God. I I began to feel, you know, uh, a sense of my sin. And I understood that where I was going with my life was wrong. I was headed the wrong direction. And I just felt empty inside. And uh, somehow I got a hold of a Bible. And I began to read. And even though I'd been raised in church, I read the Bible and God jumped off the pages like never before. And I found myself repenting and turning to God and praying. And it was like, what's going on? This is just bizarre. You know, I mean, just a few weeks later, I'm kind of hanging out with guys and partying and chasing the worldly scene and doing what I want. And all of a sudden, I'm in, in my room reading a Bible and I'm praying and I'm asking God to forgive me. And it's like, how did this happen? I didn't ask for this. I wasn't looking for this. It was God's Spirit coming to me and calling me. Jesus said, no man will come to me unless the Spirit draws him. And I believe the Holy Spirit comes and he, sometimes we say he's knocking on the door of your heart. Sometimes you think it's the burrito you ate. 
I've just spent the last week eating taco salad. This big old honking bowl of taco salad. I love it. It was so good. And my wife made it. It's great. And she didn't. I ate the whole thing. <laughs> Breakfast, lunch, and dinner for about five days. So if I look a little weird, pray for me. <laughs> but sometimes you think, oh, it's, you know, it's the it's a burrito I had or it's an indigestion. No, it's the Holy Spirit. And you might be here tonight. You're feeling a little uncomfortable and you're just like, these people are creepy. You know, they sing and they clap and they <laughs> worship God and all this Bible talk and this is just a little too weird for me. And the God's Spirit is speaking to you and he's saying that you need Jesus. If you don't turn to him, if you were to die tonight, you would go to hell, you'd be separated from him. That you're not forgiven, you're not ready to go to heaven. He convicts you of your need of Christ and you, your eyes begin to open. Spiritually, you begin to see your need of Christ, that's the Holy Spirit, I believe, drawing you to Jesus Christ. And I believe that if the Spirit is calling you, that you need to respond. So that's that effectual call where we respond to the call of God's Spirit, and we trust Him, and we believe, and we are saved. Now, I'm just going to mention something that's, again, a controversial point because we're on this doctrine. I, I'd love to spend a lot more time on it, but I don't, I don't want to bore you. But I, I want to mention that there are, in Christianity, there's kind of two basic camps when it comes to election and predestination and calling and these issues. One group is known as Calvinist or Reformed theology, and the other group is known as Armenianist. And they kind of stand on two ends of the spectrum. The Calvinist and the Reformed theologians, they emphasize the sovereignty of God and the work of God in salvation. And as I've been teaching this passage tonight, there's no doubt some of you that are listening go, man, the pastor's a Calvinist, the pastor's a Calvinist, the pastor's a Calvinist. On the other side of the coin, there's what's called Armenianism, and then their focus and their emphasis is man's side that you have free will to believe or not believe, that you can resist this calling, that you can say no to God, that you must believe, that you must repent, that you must receive Jesus Christ. And after receiving Christ, if you're not happy with your salvation, you can give it back. And go back your ways. Now, I've made a very, 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 very big, deep issue that good Christians on both sides of the spectrum have debated and argued over for many, many, many years. I've just touched a couple quick, simple points, and people that are really into this issue would probably laugh at what I just said because I'm not going into one position or the other in any depth. My position is, is that there's truth in both those spectrums, that there is truth in both those spectrums. Even though Paul says that God foreknew you and predestined you and called you and justifies you and glorifies you, there are many passages in the Bible that say that you must believe and you must repent and you must believe and trust in Jesus Christ. And it, the, the indication is that we believe and receive salvation by faith. On the other side of the coin, the Bible teaches that God chooses us. We didn't choose him. So people are like, did, did I choose him or did he choose me? Did I choose him or did he choose me? And you go, which is it, Pastor John? I believe that both are taught in the Bible and need to be understood. You go, well, they can't be both. It has to be one or the other. That's why people camp on these two sides of the spectrum. But I believe that whenever there's a doctrine in the Bible that seems irre irreconcilable, that you can't seem to put together with your little pea brain. It's called a finite mind. I believe that they reconcile in a higher unity, that God knows, God understands, and God sees. And, I, I, and I'm, I'm willing to let God worry about it, not me. I'm, I, I, I don't have any problem with accepting both. That God chose me, but I have to believe. Now, I do believe that God's 
conviction and a work of the Spirit to call it. I do believe that it can be resisted. I don't believe in what's called irresistible grace. I believe that you have free will and you can resist. And you go, okay, then you're, you're, you're an Armenian, aren't you? No, I'm not. Because I also believe that salvation is of the Lord from beginning to end. And if I'm saved, all glory to God. I have nothing to do with it. You go, no, 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 no. We are not going to let you off the hook. You can't, get, you can't do that that easy. Why not? I believe they're both taught. They're both in the scriptures. And I, I'm not going to have a, 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 a mental nervous breakdown trying to reconcile with the two. I don't, I don't have to reconcile friends. There's no issue there. If I try to explain away election, I, I can lose my salvation. If I try to, you know, take the other side of the coin, then I, if I try to figure it out, I lose my mind, you know. So I just decided to just accept them both. But I will tell you the crux of the matter. I said I wouldn't go into this, but I, I got to do this, okay? I can simplify this really simple. The Calvinist believes that regeneration has to happen in your life before you can believe in Jesus Christ and be saved or justified. The Armenianist, or the more biblicist in the middle, which I, I find myself, is I believe that faith happens at the moment you are regenerated. But regeneration, if I had to put one in front of the other, happens before faith. That, that, that the idea is that I am given the ability by the pre- regenerating work of the Holy Spirit to believe and trust Christ and be saved. And the moment I do that, boom, I'm declared righteous, I'm justified. As opposed to the Calvinists would say, you have to be regenerated because you're dead in trespasses and sins in order to believe and receive salvation. So again, again, I, I'm, I don't mean to confuse you, but a, a lot of people struggle over these issues. And the crux of the matter is, does regeneration precede or come before faith? And my answer to that is, no, it does not. That it happens at the same time. The moment you trust Jesus Christ, that you have the ability to believe that you're born again and you're saved, 